big thing going into those games was just the only story that matters is the one that you tell yourself. And so I use that all the time just to be like, yeah, this is working in your favor. Changing the schedule, awesome, working in your favor. It's snowing, perfect, just going to slow down to the track just enough to create passing opportunities. It's just whatever happened, I would tell myself that it was a good thing. And so I think just having that positive outlook with every situation really helped things too. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to episode number 10 of the Rose Bros podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Rose. Set around a cup of Rose Bros coffee, my goal is to share the life lessons of other entrepreneurs, athletes, and interesting people in general. This episode, we are joined by Kelsey Serwa Ray. Kelsey is a former member of the Canadian Ski Cross team, 2018 Olympic champion, 2014 Olympic silver medalist, world champion, national champion, and two-time X Games gold medalist. From the age of six, Kelsey progressed in the alpine ski racing world, and in 2008 was named to the Women's National Development Team for Canada. Then in 2009, Kelsey transitioned to ski cross. With the 2010 Vancouver Olympics looming, she instantly made a name for herself, earning the prestigious Fist Rookie of the Year award while making the Canadian National Ski Cross team. In this episode, we talked about staying positive in difficult times, trusting yourself, and funding for amateur sport, among other things. Kelsey's lessons of using positivity in your daily life are something that really rings true given all the negativity these days with the coronavirus. Kelsey, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much, Trevor. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's been a long time. It has been a long time, yeah. It's cool, though, because the whole social era, the whole social world, even though you haven't seen people in 10 or so years, it still feels like you have a connection to them, just following in their day-to-day lives. Absolutely. Born and raised in Kelowna, and you grew up ski racing. I originally met you when I was a ski racer. How did you get into ski racing? It's actually a pretty funny story, because neither of my parents grew up ski racing. Of course, they spent time up at Big White. I have an older brother and sister, and... I don't know, I was maybe five or six at the time. Local Big White Racers program needed to move their ski club cabin. So my parents did the work in exchange for free Nancy Green lessons for myself and my two older siblings. They kind of joked that that was the most expensive basement that they ever dug, but that was how I got involved in ski racing. So you were probably six, seven, eight, nine years old? Yeah, got to be in there. I think 95, 96 era. So yeah, six, six years old. Raced well in your teenage years. When did you race until? Continued through Alpine racing until I was 18 and we spent a few good years together for like 15, 16, 17, 18. Yep. And then in at the end of 2008, 2009, that winter season, I was really struggling with, with alpine racing. Knew that I kind of had two options, one being to, to retire from sport entirely and then the other would be try this new sport, which I heard it just made its it was going to be debuted in the 2010 Vancouver Olympics, and that was ski cross. So I actually traveled from Eastern Spring Series with Stan, who we were just really good friends at the time, but funny looking back, because now we're married. We traveled to the first ever Canadian Nationals at Red Mountain. I loved the sport. I remember like after the first day, just being so, so, so sore just using different muscles in a different way but it was dynamic it was fun it was still ski racing everything was like higher amplitude that summer i think i was just as annoying as i could be to all the coaches and staff and sending emails and like how can i get involved how can i do this when are you guys making team selection what was the criteria and so i worked my way on with the team from then. So 2009 was my first season, all the way through three Olympic Games and just retired at the end of last season. So in 2009, you won your first World Cup race and you also made the national team. Which one was first? Would have made the national team in that summer going into the 2009 season, but the year of the Olympics. So 2009, 2010. So yeah, December 2009 there, I guess. It was, yeah, right before the Olympics. So what perfect timing to boost that confidence going into a home games. And you were also a really good ski racer. When you quit ski racing, were you on the British Columbia ski team? Were you on the national team at that point? I was on a team that was called the 2010 
Vancouver Acceleration Team. So they basically took a bigger roster of girls from throughout Canada and brought them together, and we were all stationed in, in Fernie, BC, and we spent a summer of really intensive training in the gym and on our mountain bikes and then really hard on snow conditions, just long days. I remember going up to Farnham Glacier and setting our alarms for three in the morning so we could be on the top of the mountain skiing by 5 a.m. So stuff like that, which was, yeah, I mean, it was cool. It was so amazing. Yeah. So that was that was my final year of alpine racing as part of that team. 2008 season? Yeah, exactly. You were struggling, though. What was going on at that time? I mean, I was making the right step, you know, going from big white racers to kind of this zone team and then on to the BC ski team with you, Trevor, and then up to the like this national development team. And so, you know, things were, were really looking good. But then my last winter of racing Alpine, we traveled to Europe. So cool. My first winter over there. And we followed slalom race after slalom race after slalom race. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a slalom skier. I love downhill. I love GS, Super G, and just really struggled at ever putting two fast runs together in slalom. I mean, one of the problems was that I just, like, explode every run. It wasn't fun anymore. It was... You know, there were kind of seven of us on the team, and there was only ever six spots for races. So here I was in Europe. It was awesome, but my role was pretty much to unload and load a van, move to a new location, try and qualify. It was the slowest lawn skier, so I wouldn't get to race. So I'd unload and load the van. I'm like, oh, this is a cool way to spend 15 grand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was my, my last year with Alpine. You made the decision to jump into skier cross as the Olympics were looming. It sounds like there was a lot of money going into skier cross at the time. Yeah, actually, the Canada ski cross team was privately funded, which is really cool. And then it was only the year of the Olympics or even after that, that we became part of freestyle, Canada freestyle to, and under that body to make it more official. So yeah, really, really cool. So you got going in 2009, 2010 comes along. Was your goal to compete in those Olympics? It was, which is crazy when you think about it because you have one year to figure out this new sport. But I think just the environment that I came into, just a very welcoming team, Ashley McIver, Julia Murray, a couple of the other girls were just very helpful in, in teaching you what to do where, kind of showing you your options. And then, of course, being able to rub elbows. And, and those girls were the best in the world. I mean, myself, uh, Danny Pleschuk also came in at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it was just a very, uh, you know, conducive environment for growth and learning. And I think it just gave us the opportunity to fast track both of us onto that Olympic team. You had a medal at the skier cross winter X games as well in 2010? Yeah, a, th a third place, I think. That would have been, I guess, my second time at the X games. My first time at the X games, I got an, a nice little concussion, still learning the sport. I mean, it took me years to figure it out. In fact, the cool thing with ski cross is that just because of the number of variables that are taking place at one time i mean you can control yourself but you can't control these other people around you mm -hmm. so it's a different run each time so i mean i think as a student of the sport it continues every single year but i mean you learn to to get a better feel understanding for the track and stuff but anyways at my first x games i jumped right off the track landed not on the landing of a jump and totally just piled drove myself into the ground um, but yeah, the year of the Olympics yeah. got third. I think <laughs> Ashley was second, and our guys did well that year too. Coming in that year, 2010 Olympics in Canada, you were pretty heavily favored then. I wouldn't say a, f a favorite by any means. I'd say just like within contention in my mind. I probably saw myself as a stronger contender than other people saw me as. But I think that's important to do as an athlete, to believe in yourself and your abilities. The next year, 2011, after those Olympics, things started to get better. You, I think you won a world championship gold medal in Deer Valley? That's right, yeah. The race before that, too, was X Games again. And we had this massive finish jump, which I overjumped the landing. And I think we flew about 150 feet onto my butt. And I actually broke my back. 
among some other things, just compression fractures, just literally from the force of landing, but then had to race world championships one week later. And in that final heat, it was insane. (laughs) So it was myself with a broken back, Julia Murray, who had a a fully blown ACL, which we didn't know at the time. I didn't know that I had a broken back either. One girl was racing with only one pole, essentially, because she had fractured her wrist the heat prior and got into the finals. And then the fourth girl, I believe she was completely healthy. So anyways, yeah, at World Champs, I got first. Julia got second. The two most busted up people (laughs) at that race. (laughs) And we pulled it off. It was really cool. (laughs) By that time, you were a full member of the ski cross team competing Mm -hmm. full time. That was your career, more or less? Yep, exactly. Yeah, it's a good old ski bum. But that was before you won your any of your Olympic medals. In 2014 mm-hmm. in Sochi, did you win an Olympic medal that? Olympic Games? Or? Yeah. Yeah, I won a, won a silver medal. That was a crazy journey, too, because I, I had blown my knee twice in the two years leading up to those games. And I had re-injured myself in January. And the Olympics happened in February. So I barely raced that year. So there was a lot of mental work and mental prep that went into that Olympic Games and a lot of, I don't know, not blind, blind faith, blind trust, but, yeah. you know, a little a little uh, scary to show up to the biggest track that we see every four years being the Olympic Games and maybe bodies running at like 70% mm-hmm. and, and going out there and just trusting your team, trusting yourself, trusting your abilities and all the, the mental prep that you've put into it. Fitness wise, I'm sure that was, it's been a big component of your training throughout the years. What were you doing to train? Was it a year round program, a lot of weights? I mean, it was, it was very similar to what we were doing in Alpine, summertime mornings, five days a week in the gyms, lower body focus, upper body focus, speed, agility, quickness, jumps, landing. Gymnastics too became a big part of it in the later years. And then afternoons were just always on our mountain bikes, ripping around the trails and trying to go faster and time on two wheels. And then come, did like a few camps. We maybe got 30 days in, 20 to 30 days in the summer on snow. So then by the time December hit, we were well prepared and and ready to start racing. What was your opinion on fitness as compared to time on snow? Some people feel that it's more of a mental sport and fitness isn't as important. I should go back and listen to Ben and Brady's conversation with you if you ask them the same question. I'd like to know their opinion. It's actually interesting. Uh, Different responses. For me, fitness and, and training, I think it's so, so important to mitigate risks. And to be able to handle the amount of forces that we put our bodies through. Also, having a a really solid proprioceptive system. If someone knocks you off balance going into a turn or off a jump and you're able to recover from that and prevent a major injury from happening, I think that's huge. Also, with strength pulling out of a gate, if you win the start in a ski cross, that makes your job a lot easier just with the first two people getting to advance to that next round. But also coming down to the fundamental techniques of of skiing, the more you can bend a ski, the more energy you can get out of it, granted that you do it at the right time. So, I mean, that's all going to make you a, a faster racer. So I don't think being super strong and fit ever hurt anybody. Mm-hmm. I think also huge, huge benefit just having a solid endurance base, racing weekend after weekend and being able to recover in that time is huge. As for time on snow, I know there's been a lot of different opinions, even with the athletes on our team, regarding how much time each person thinks or they feel that yeah. they need. But I was always up for the optional camps, going out and skiing, I think just because I love it. It's so important to to love the sport that you're doing. And so it never would feel like a chore so I never really understood why people were like oh I'm not going to that camp it's stupid <laughs> mm-hmm. did you, you know? think that some athletes got pulled in overtraining just because of the optics towards their coaches sometimes maybe they shouldn't have gone to certain camps and were overtrained I think that our program has been very well designed to prevent overtraining and uh, overreaching anything like that from occurring. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to say no to a coach, right? When you're trying to make the team and you're trying to impress the team and the coaches. You never I think got just that. because like a lot of the guys that were on the team 
that are on the team now were also on the team from the beginning. Uh So there wasn't this hierarchy necessarily of whatever coach says that's what has to be done. Mm -hmm. You know, it was usually a very inclusive conversation of, okay, I think this is what we need as a team. What do you guys feel and what do you want to do? Especially in the later years, having a head coach that was a team member during the inception of Canada Ski Cross, Stanley Hare, Mm -hmm. he understands what it's like to be on the athlete side of things and and he's taken that into his coaching philosophy. So a lot of it is, what do you guys want to do? What do you feel you need? And then, of course, talking with the people that know the science behind the strength and conditioning and volume and days and and all that to create a program that is individualized for our team our needs and also within the means that we have to work with how about inspiration when you were racing who were your the people you looked towards was there anyone in particular i always kept my vision close being on the best team in the world you never had to look far for inspiration and it was just my teammates around me really it was so strong and and so positive both on the men and women's side and you look at Chris Del Bosco who pretty much came up with this whole style for pressing jumps and you look at the everyone on tour and they've mimicked him and copied him and and taking that to the track so that I mean that's really cool that our tour is small enough that you get this close connection this close friendship with people but it's something that I mean you take every bits of every athlete and try and the best parts of them and and try and bring them together and and fit them in with your own style 2018 was that the olympics you won the gold medal in yeah so how was that it was the coolest thing ever actually my best friend and teammate Britt, both of us were kind of we were joking that we were kind of like the queens of the small final so all season we were kind of getting from fifth to eighth place knocking on the door a few times i think both of us had like a fourth place finish here and there but going into those games, like, by no means were we favorite. And I think people kind of uh, forgot about us, which was really cool. Because then we were able just to do our own thing, our own prep. And, you know, things that had worked for us in the in the years leading up to these games. I think, too, just having someone that is on the same wavelength as you, that you can bounce ideas off of, that is, you know, is genuinely invested in your success as they are their own it was like a completely reciprocal relationship i think that was huge in creating just a really positive uh, experience around those 2018 games going in there knowing that it was my last games it sounds funny but i just like totally surrendered to the experience and just really trusted all the prep that we had done our team was super dialed staff was on point our sports psychologist was there in person and and doing some work with us everything lined up in a perfect way all the way down to like we got to watch the boys compete a few days before beautiful and sunny and you know brady won and kevin was fourth but just watching how fast their skis were watching them take off from the competition that was that was huge in the confidence world you know our ski technicians obviously killed it stan he surprised me and showed up at the olympics on that day at the men's race so i saw him in the stands i was like what yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's so cool so i mean even that and then two days later weather was rolling in again it's so funny because for every olympic games the men have had beautiful sunny days like warm biggest issue is just that the track softens for them over time and then by the time the women race it's like foggy rainy windy snowy just really brutal (laughs) and so sure enough we got the word that Another storm was rolling in, so they were going to bump up the schedule. They put qualifying on the day before, and then we were going to race the final starting at 10 a.m. on, like, the original planned day. So even even little things like that just totally worked in our favor. My big thing, too, going into those games was just the only story that matters is the one that you tell yourself. And so I use that all the time just to be like, yeah, this is working in your favor. Changing the schedule, awesome, working in your favor. It's snowing, perfect, just going to slow down to the track just enough to create passing opportunities. It's just whatever happened, I would tell myself that it was a good thing. And so I think just having that like positive outlook with every situation really helped things too. How much do you think sport is mental compared to physical? I think it's for sure a huge part i mean everyone at an elite level in sport there is strong granted 
everyone has their few nagging injuries that they deal with just throughout their careers, but people are strong, people are physically fit, they have the endurance to last through a day. The make or break is often what's going on between your ears for sure. So you won that gold medal. Well, so what happened after that? I was talking to Brady Lehman and he said it was kind of a blur. It was one thing after another, you're a champion. and Yeah, it happened. Obviously, Britt and I being in the finish line together, just so freaking thrilled. <laughs> like really can't <laughs> believe it to stand there. And then we were kind of getting our stuff sorted, and I saw Stan. Mm-hmm. Oh, he had, like, rushed to the to the finish line area, and I went over there. I gave him a hug and gave him a kiss. He was crying, so I, called, I was like, are you crying? He's like, yeah, I'm just so happy. <laughs> and I'm like, after I kissed him, I'm like, oh, did you go out last night? Your beard smells like booze. He's like, yeah, I am. We got it at, like, 5 a.m. It's, <laughs> this is so great. <laughs> They actually almost missed a race from partying too hard in Korea. (laughs) Come all the way to surprise me and then almost miss the race. So anyways, yeah, we go through equipment testing to make sure that our suits are the right size, bagginess, that boots and skis are all up to regulation. Go through a little media gauntlet, which was fun because Britt and I did all of our interviews together. Fortunately, she speaks French, so she got to cover the French side of everything and I just covered the English side. Mm -hmm. Got to see my family right after that. My mom, my dad came out. My my grandparents, they flew out also. So that was really nice. And then we go on to doping control. Wait in a room until someone's ready to watch you pee in a cup. Mm -hmm. And then take some a blood sample also poor Brit, she was so hydrated so you have to have like a specific gravity concentration in your urine for them to be able to test it if you're too hydrated then your urine is way too diluted to test she i think she took three tests and she was too hydrated every single time but after the third one they can't do anything more mm-hmm. While I shuttled down to the coast, which was two hours away, to do TV media and stuff, Britt was a few hours behind just because of of her inability to produce a concentrated sample. And then we finally caught up that night. I think we met up with our parents at Canada House, had some champagne, got back by one in the morning or something, like totally gassed. It's funny talking with Britt because she's like I don't think I slept for like three days leading into our finals race Mm -hmm. and we definitely didn't sleep that night Mm -hmm. and it was just like complete exhaustion um, right after that it was insane at that point you had won a gold medal you were doing pretty well in your career you were one of the best skiers in Canada one of the best ski cross athletes in Canada so things were moving along at that point I think I even saw a cardboard cutout of you in Safeway when I was what? Yeah. You should have stole it. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, holy cow, things are really rolling for Kelsey. As a professional athlete, probably doing pretty well financially, what was that scenario like as a ski cross athlete in Canada? It's interesting because as an athlete in Canada, and I'm sure Brady spoke to this too, prize money for our sport isn't all that much, especially if you compare it to the alpine side of things, right? It's not even 10%, I think, is, is what those guys get. As an amateur athlete, we make money before the Olympics and during the Olympics. And then that's it for the cycle, essentially. So we have an opportunity to, you know, get some good sponsors and have some good support. Of course, those that Olympic year. But after that, it kind of all drops off and you feel that right away. So it's interesting. You kind of you go through these cycles and some years it's really good and of course it's based on your performance and some years it's a little tougher and for whatever reason but you know I've been I've been really fortunate throughout my career cuz the sponsors that I have I've had they've cut, they've been with me from the beginning and it's not necessarily they don't do it to to get TV time with their little logo on our jacket. They do it to be part of the story and because they want to be part of, of the success and show their maybe their employees, you know, what it means to have a dream and work for it. And it's been really cool. Great personal relationships with these companies and with my supporters and something that I've been really proud and continuing after retirement too, those relationships. 
You were flying along 2018. Those are the good times. What about tough times? Can you speak to some times where maybe things weren't going so well? I know you've had a couple injuries. How did you get through those times? For sure. Yeah, I've had a couple injuries. I've had three knee surgeries, two ACL reconstructions, and then a cartilage transplant all within the same knee. So that's kind of been my biggest issue. I broke my back at X Games in 2011. Still, not that I lost any time from that, but still feel its effects today. It's like standing for too long, for example. Just really gets everything tight. And When you say you broke oh, your back, yeah. what is that? Is that yeah, in a wheelchair? Yeah, uh, just compression fractures, so T7 and T9. So basically, I squished the vertebrae, if you can imagine that. Like, I, I just landed so hard on that bum drop that I squished squished those vertebrae and as well as sprained and strained all the ligaments and muscles the small little guys that attach into into your spinal column there and your processes i guess rather nothing more or less than what most people deal with i think through a career something now that i definitely have to stay on top of keep moving that's the biggest part stay nimble stay strong so after 2014, actually, I took a, f- a full season off just to let my body heal from these knee injuries, essentially. And then when I came back to sport, I knew in reality that it wasn't just going to be smooth sailing. But in my mind, I was like, you know, maybe it could be. Maybe I can just come back and hop back on the podium. But that first season back, it was such a struggle fest. It was getting knocked out first round, ra- kind of race after race. Lucky if I got to a small final. And just, you know, nothing was coming together. And it, again, it's you get frustrated because you care and you want to do well. And when you're not doing well, you, you tell yourself, all right, just keep working, stay positive, keep putting in the effort, it'll all come together. But when that happens, race after race after race, it really takes its toll on you. So I definitely had some dark moments in that season, literally struggled through it the whole way. But again, I guess if there's a silver lining, you, you take that and you use it as motivation to maybe the approach wasn't right. So you change the summer, summer training a little bit and go back to the basics of, you know, why do you love the sport? Why do you do it? What is it that draws you towards it? You know, what is what is your North Star, basically. So I think after some, some reassessment there. But, I mean, for every for every time you stand on top of the podium, you're off the podium looking up at whoever's there 90% of the time. If that's, a like, a good career, I feel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's definitely more down days than up days, but I think those down days are more what's character building than those up days, for sure. Any philosophies you lean towards? Any good books? It all comes down to being true true to yourself. It's cool looking back on my three Olympic Games because I was very different mentally at each one of those games and probably had a very different approach to each one of those games. So it's cool to look back and see how that has evolved. 2010, probably very naive, very just open to everything whatever anyone said to do it was like no questions asked absolutely i'll do it 2014 just coming in with an injury and and taking a full-on mental approach very anxious and and probably panicky and mega stressed out and then 2018 just completely relaxed being confident in what i need as an athlete as an individual having my best friend there that just kind of reconfirmed that our needs were the same a partner in crime essentially to do everything with again surrendering to those games accepting the state the fate i guess that we were in standing in that start gate and all there was left to do was perform three very different outlooks as i mentioned kind of my last two seasons there is just the only story that matters is the one that you tell yourself it's simple little things just framing everything in in a, a positive light obviously not being delusional but realizing that there is something good that can come from you know, missing the podium or crashing or those sixth place finishes. If you even just pull out one good thing that happened in a day, then I think you just feel a lot more optimistic about life moving forward in general. How about steroids? Did you ever encounter any of that when you were ski racing? <laughs> no, I mean... As I wish you could see my big muscles right now. <laughs> Was that ever no, a problem in ski cross? Definitely not. I don't think that on the women's side, I wouldn't say it was. And you, you don't know enough about it to say that's the case on the men's side either. But, I mean, it was definitely interesting watching that Icarus movie. Yeah. 
I talked right? about that and watching Brady. that whole thing come out. I bet you talked yeah to Brady about that and Ben. Yeah. When you see something like that, when it's a government wide, a nation wide doping program, then it's hard to have faith in that athletes were not doping. I'm trying to stay as unpolitical as possible, but I mean, you're it, retired you kinda, now. <laughs> Yeah, you kind of, I mean, you notice things when athletes are really bad one year and they come back and they've gained like 30 pounds and they're a machine out of the start gate and for no reason other than, man, they maybe they worked really hard that summer. You know, it, it just makes you wonder, I think. Were there any but, countries uh, in particular that you noticed? Like the, culp- the usual suspects like Russia? Yeah, I would say so. Again, it's hard. It's so hard to say and without pointing fingers and I mean negative tests or I mean other than the Russia scandal they we still get tested we got tested outside of Russia from the World Anti-Doping Association that was totally not controlled right like not regulated by Russia in any way so I mean if they're passing those tests and they pass tests after then maybe they're clean yeah one point Brady made was that it has become more of a intelligence or an IQ test rather than a test for whether you're doping or not if you can outsmart it so you never saw any of that didn't see it no I think too in in our sport because it is so tactical right. that sure if you if you weigh more and just because we're in gravity and inertia is is obviously advantageous and you're powerful and quick it'll help you get out the gate but if you can't navigate down a course with jumps and rollers and bank turns you're just going to explode Britt has a really funny saying she's like yeah you know when when speed outweighs technical ability that's when you see explosions happen on track so you still got to be technically savvy enough to get down yeah that being said in ski cross where it is a more technical tactical sport maybe it doesn't affect the sport as much as it would cycling easy example right where mm-hmm. it's a lot of it is it's probably 90 percent physical when you were growing up as a ski racer was your goal to become a world cup ski racer how did you ever imagine you end up in ski cross i definitely didn't imagine that i would end up in ski cross i think it was 2007 do you remember sandra mcdonald of course you do absolutely Yeah, we were in Whistler, we were forerunning like Canadian Nationals or something, and I saw it for the first time on TV. It was a a Jeep tour or something, and I was like, oh oh my god, I can't believe this is a sport, first of all. Second of all, these people look insane and nuts and like super big and strong, and they're going so fast and and taking these hard wipeouts. So my first uh, exposure to it, I don't think I would ever think that I would get involved with it. And then you work your way in there and then you progress through it and all of a sudden what seemed out of reach is totally within reach. So that was really cool. But also growing up, my only dream as a kid was to own, <laughs> this is so funny, was to own a punch buggy. Okay. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and you, <laughs> Olympics, World Cup, none of that was on my radar. I just want to drive a cool little convertible. <laughs> mm-hmm. A little bit different focus, I guess. I don't know. Retired now, you're currently going to UBC Okanagan. Mm-hmm. What's next? What's the plans for your life now? Because you're still relatively young. Thanks, Trevor. That's really kind of you. <laughs> After this super strange semester, which wraps up, don't even know when it's going to wrap up now. April, end of April, maybe. I'll have one more to go, one more semester going to do some work with the UBCO soccer team, women's soccer team. Hopefully I can offer some sports psychology wisdom in their performance on demand, stuff like that, but also be taping ankles. And and then I want to go into physiotherapy. I'll apply, try to keep it local here in BC, hopefully apply to Vancouver and Prince George has a program now. So two years of that for a master's program and then I'll be able to look after Stan because he still sends it in the backcountry pretty hard. He comes home with sore shoulders and mm-hmm. sore knees and such. So maybe we'll save a little coin that way. Plan is to finish up school and are you still involved with any of your foundations? I noticed you had a few yeah. going at one point. Yeah, so I, I do have a scholarship fund 
just to help support the next generation of up and coming athletes out of my community in Kelowna. So we we actually gave away ten thousand dollars last year, which was really cool. It was their most successful year to date. I think we'll we'll give away three scholarships this year. So that's really cool, and that'll go on forever and ever and ever and ever. Just dope. What was the name of that? Um, call it Kaiser Scholarship Fund. And then still got my hands in some other nonprofit organizations that I was involved in as an athlete and just continue that support. Kids Sport is one of them. Their whole motto is so all kids can play. So it's just removing the financial barriers for families that might not be able to afford to put their kids in sport. Mm-hmm. So that's really cool. Still representing the land skis, which is awesome. My skis are a little bit wider now yeah. and, and more colorful than the old race skis. And just staying on as an ambassador there. And, of course, at my home mountain, Big White Ski Resort. So lots of stuff that kind of working on in little bits. And I'd like to kind of mention earlier that I just feel it's so important to maintain the good relationships that you've built over the years. So we'll see where professional career goes moving forward. I think it's fun. Stan and I will probably have a few kids along the way and that I'm sure that'll have a whole new world of adventures with it too so who knows can you see yourself going back to the ski world as a maybe an executive or on the board of something it could be cool to go back on as a board of directors or something I think it's important to spend time a little bit of time away from it just to process what is going on and, and maybe get some different world views a wider perspective and I, I haven't seriously considered anything of, of much in that direction, but I would definitely be open to giving it a try, I think. How is the state of ski cross in Canada post-2010? For instance, the national team in Canada for alpine ski racing has had its troubles the last few years. What's the case for ski cross? I think it's similar to any amateur sport in Canada. Kind of what I mentioned before is that we get good funding the year before the Olympics, the year of the Olympics. And then as soon as that cycle is over, everything gets cut and directed towards summer sports, which it needs to be because there's not this unlimited surplus of money coming in. So we definitely feel the effects in the year after the Olympics and the year after that. And then it kind of slowly wraps up again, going towards the next cycle of, of games. I mean, it, it, it ebbs and flows for sure, but our, throughout it all, the team is, is adjusted and, and stayed strong and maybe it's less on snow camps or maybe we go to a different place, one that's not as expensive and smaller teams or whatever. Yeah, they make it work. It seems that skiing in general has never been about the money in Canada. So funny. I met some people this year. International Airlines Ski Championships came to Big White. Got to meet a couple of, of the directors there. A couple guys from Europe, they were like, oh, so like you won an Olympic medal. You must be set for life. I'm like, yeah, well, I have two of them. But no, it's not that case here in Canada. They're like, oh, man, if you win an Olympic gold medal in Austria, you get money every month from the government, 3,000 euros or something, and never have to work a day, another day in your life. Like you said, it's not about the money here, because if it were, you wouldn't see as many Canadians competing. I think it's just about, yeah, the passion, setting those goals, striving for them, going through these adversity is seeing the world making meaningful relationships throughout it it's just so much more i got that impression talking to brady too he seems like fell in love with the process more than anything totally it feels good to be around people that are super passionate and driven that you can relate to because even on those down days you feed off their energy and it just pumps you right back up when you compare it to say a pro sport like the nhl or the nba where if you make the team in the NHL you're more or less set I think a lot of people don't realize in Canada if you make the national team you're not necessarily set for life no and a lot of the athletes are on national teams are still having to pay their way so they're forking out 20 grand 10 grand depending on again what sort of funding we have that year so it, it's easy to view a lot of the athletes through social media and being like, oh, they have this super easy life, everything's paid for, everything's mm-hmm. good, but that's not always the case. Do you see that changing in Canada, or is it is it getting better, or it's the same? Again, it, it follows these cycles, and it's all due around the Olympics, so mm-hmm. in years of the Olympics and, and just before, then there's a lot more funding, so a lot more athletes can be brought on 
to a fuller extent. And, and in the years between, it's, so you see more athletes maybe having to cover more of their meals or their flights, accommodation, trips, camps, plus a 10 grand fee just to be on the team. Our team is set up in, in the sense that if you perform well, if you get podiums and you're, you're top 10, then um, you get performance equals privilege. Mm-hmm. So if you're at that upper level, which there was only a few on the Canada Ski Cross team this year even, everyone else is paying. It's more of a labor love than anything. For sure, yeah. So which you, also makes it that much more fulfilling, I think. Absolutely, in it for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. So you retired in 2019, this past summer. What was the decision behind that? I knew I was I was actually going to retire after the 2018 season, mm-hmm. and it was Britt that was, oh, we're having so much fun, can't leave me, you're still getting better, like, this is so cool, just do one more year, and I, I think I, I heard it enough, and she is a very good negotiator, so I, I committed to one more year, and, and just to enjoy, I don't know, if you want to call it a victory lap, going out there and, and working hard and putting in the time, and for sure still getting... Uh, frustrated when the results weren't there but shooting for the podium every race but also really enjoying the travel the experiences the people the resorts that final season and I'm really glad I did because it was it was good it was a nice way to end a career and I was very fortunate that I had the opportunity to do so and also that I got to choose when I retired and it wasn't someone else making that decision for me I think that is so uncommon now mm-hmm. which is sad but it was basically, you know, my body, my knees hurt, and it. I, I want to be able to be active and rip around when I'm older, and mm-hmm. also wanted to experience the next phases of life. Yeah, Stan and I got married this September, so that was mm-hmm. part of it too, and, and moving forwards with him, and just taking a little chunk out of everything moving forward. I wanted to have time for that. So you've got two Olympic medals now, you've got a world championship medal, you've got three X Games medals. If you were to give advice to a young racer coming up, what would you tell them? I think it would be to not specialize in anything at too young of an age. Do as many sports as you can for as long as you can. I think that's so key in that we, we lose sight of that now. Everyone wants to be the best, so they think that's solely doing one sport from six years old is is how you're going to achieve that and i totally disagree if you don't love it you're not going to put in the time that's required to to be the best and also hard work will get you a lot further in life than talent ever will be ready to put in the hours love every minute of it even the really dark days and and struggles again it's makes those good days that much better knowing that you fought for it awesome well i think that's a great place to leave taking time and you're busy with school and whatnot it's great to catch up yeah good to catch up with you trevor next time on a podcast make sure you're my first guest yeah absolutely hey everyone thanks for listening hope you enjoyed the show if you liked what you heard head over to rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming episodes you can also find our coffee and chocolate there where we plant one tree for every bag or bar sold through our partnership with one tree planted a non-for-profit organization focused on global reforestation. Otherwise, until next time, happy coffee drinking.